impressive piece of work you've got going on here and I know it happens on a regular basis. Um, also just to say that I joined uh, a bit earlier just to make sure that Wi-Fi was, was working from here. So I, I caught some of Octavia's presentation, just great. And then also Philippa's. So really lovely to hear Philippa, how you're um, focusing on the big picture, making those connections. Um, and uh, just really, really impressive. But I'm actually going to pick up um, a bit on Octavia's now um, by saying in these times, we really do need to have our masks on first, in my humble opinion. Um, and I think it's important generally within education because it is such an exhausting job. It's a joyful job, but it's absolutely shattering. And um, people who've not done it do not realize that depth of exhaustion that comes even when times are normal. So Octavia's um, really good advice in terms of making sure that we take our downtime, our relaxation really seriously, um, because if we don't, then we're going to keel over. So masks on first, we all know in the days when we were able to travel regularly on planes, you know, the, the safety um, instructions were always, you know, if there's an emergency and you're traveling with someone who is either vulnerable or a young child, you put your own mask on first. Um, why? Because you cannot help anyone else unless you have protected yourself first. So it's not about being selfish. It's about being sensible um, if we want to do this job long term. And I think never more so than than now. And um, I would just summarize in three, although I think Octavia's done that uh, beautifully, is um, first of all, we're making sure we get enough sleep. Um, different if we've got little babies at home, but if we haven't, then making sure we get enough sleep, going to bed early enough, eating properly on a regular basis and getting enough fresh air, getting fresh air every day, really, really important. Okay, so um, just to share with you um, the emphasis really that we cannot do everything. So let's just stop trying to do everything. Um, I think the education profession is so dedicated that we tend to think we've got to do everything and we simply can't. There are always going to be some tough choices. There's always going to be some trade-offs. So whether it's in these uncertain times that we are in the moment, um, managing, you know, the lockdown and, and children in and out and all those safety um, precautions around the work we're doing, or whether it is our more standard work around curriculum development and school improvement, we've got to lock in the idea that we cannot do everything and uh, we can only do what we can do and we focus on the things that are going to have the greatest impact. So I'm going to be sharing with you then just some thinking around high challenge and low threat for everyone in the sector, both adults and uh, children. Um, and I'm going to do a thought experiment by way of this just quite quickly. So in this thought experiment, to underpick the, uh, under, uh, unpick the idea of high challenge and low threat, um, I'm going to ask you to imagine that in the next few moments, um, everyone on this conference, including me, we're all going to be sitting a test. So that means because it's going to happen very shortly, it's unseen, it's unprepared for, but we're all just going to crack on and do it. Now, um, after about 10 minutes, it's just a short test. We're going to stop, we're going to pause, uh, have a little bit of a break. And then uh, during that time, through the magic of the internet, this unseen, unprepared for test will be marked. And then we're going to come back into the room um, but this time we're going to be ranked on how we did in that unseen, unprepared for test. So just pause for a minute to see what your reaction is to that. Now, when I've done this live, about 90% of people say that they feel psychologically very uncomfortable. About 90% of people are feeling very um, uncomfortable at thought of that unseen, unprepared for test. About 10% of people um, are fine with it. Some people even get a bit of an adrenaline rush at the prospect of a test. But for the, mo for the most part, for most of us, it's a very uncomfortable space to be. Now, when I unpack it um, with colleagues, um, generally what people say was, well, we were okay up until the point when we realized we were going to be ranked. So something um, really quite acute happens when we realized we're going to be judged, our performance is going to be judged against other people's. And it's this that for the most part is um, really can sometimes be quite distressing. But um, I put it to you colleagues that either you or someone you know um, does something like uh, crossword puzzles, um, Sudoku, maths puzzles, word puzzles, that sort of thing by way of relaxation in their own time. Now, I'm arguing that these are a form of test. 
Now, they're not literally a test, but they're a form of test in that what's happening here is we're putting ourselves under cognitive pressure to do something quite difficult by way of relaxation. Now, I do quite a lot of Sudoku and um, I can do the easy ones and the moderate ones and I'm now tackling the difficult ones. Every now and then I'll give myself a bit of a break and I'll go back and do one of the easy or moderate ones. And what I find is when I complete those, I don't get the same sense of satisfaction out of completing them that I do um, if I have completed one of the more difficult ones. So what's happening there is that when we achieve something that we've had to put some effort into, um, that we doesn't immediately fall into our lap, um, we get a rush of dopamine. So that's the pleasure hormone. And that happens as a result of doing difficult, demanding work. Um, however, where these don't bear comparison with tests or examinations is that we're doing these in our own time. We've got control over how long we take. We've got control over who we decide to share the outcomes with. So that's where it differs. It differs. Uh, but nevertheless, we've got an interesting situation where people are spending a lot of money uh, in order to buy these things. Because you go into any news agents, you go into any supermarket, there's yards of this stuff. Now, they don't give it shelf space if it's not making money. So what I'm arguing from this is that we like doing things that are difficult. We are a challenge-seeking species as long as there's no danger um, of anyone making us feel like a Muppet. Right. Now, I've got to be careful here because the Muppets do good work on Sesame Street, but you get my drift. Nobody wants to be made to feel stupid. Um, <coughs> and in that thought experiment, there was the potential to be made to feel stupid, which is why it was so uncomfortable for many of us. And yet, on the other hand, we like doing things that are difficult. So what I'm arguing from this is that we are, in fact, a challenge-seeking species, that we like doing things that are difficult as long as the conditions are right. And one of the th ways of going about this is making sure that um, we separate the work from the person. So we separate how we talk about our own work, our colleagues' work, children's work, separately from them as a human being or from me as a human being. So we can critique the work, but we leave the person separate. And um, I don't have time to develop it now, but Kim Scott's radical candor is really helpful here. Um, distancing language, well, I noticed this, and is this the case, rather than saying you've got this wrong um, or you've got this absolutely right. Well, let's just explore what might be right. Um, and so that what also follows from that is that we do not grade people's lessons um, because they self-identify with the grade or the, um, the standard they've been given. Um, we talk about just the lesson, making sure that it's separated from the person. Because unfortunately in England, we've had a tradition of lessons being graded because that's what the inspectorate did. They stopped several years ago. Most schools have stopped, sadly, uh, not all. But where a lesson might have, need, might have needed some improvement, you had people, uh, significant improvement, so therefore it was deemed to be inadequate. Um, what, what happened was you had people who who thought that they were inadequate, I'm inadequate. No, just that lesson might have needed quite a bit of attention. And to me, that's a crying shame that we have lost um, so many good people on the back of that crude feedback. Um, and similarly with children, there are too many children who self-identify with the grade or the level that they're working at, rather than seeing this is the work and not about them as a human being. Um, so um, I'm arguing from this that we do our, our best work in conditions of, which are characterized by high challenge, but it has to be low threat. Uh, otherwise, we're not, um, we're not going to be prepared to talk about the things that might have gone wrong in our practice and talk with colleagues about it. We might not be prepared to share the good things that are going well in our practice because we're worried people are going to think we're big headed. So it's a complicated and important area, I think, to unpack um, for us as adults and professionals and wanting to, to improve our practice. But let's turn now to what it is that pupils say. So um, I'm... I take pupil voice really seriously. It's a big um, research interest of mine and it's a thread of my work. Um, and at the heart of what they're saying in my work and research is they're saying they would like more demanding work, please. They would like more demanding work, please. Um, 
I think as a sector, we are inclined to make too many things too easy for too many of our children in the mistaken belief they can't cope particularly those who might be identified as low prior retaining, which I'm going to share some examples of in a moment. Um, uh, but I was doing some work in a London school um, a while ago, um, and I was asked to talk to some students about what they thought um, that the, the school had identified as being high prior retaining, but underachieving, able but idle. I'm sure you've got one of the two of those in, in your settings. Um, so I sat down and I, I talked to these students. So there are about half, half a dozen of them. They were year nines and they happened to be all boys. And I said, is there any subject in this school where you're not messing around? Because they weren't working, but they were stopping others from working as well. And in this school, it turned out it was geography. So I said, well, what's happening in geography then? That means that you're not doing that you're not messing around, you're letting others get on with their work as well. And they said, well, our teacher just gives us really interesting, difficult material to read for homework. So, for instance, articles from publications like the National Geographic um, and other sources as well. And what she says to us is, your job for homework is to read this. Now, you're not going to understand it, but that's all right, because at the start of the next lesson, we're going to talk about what you did understand and what you didn't understand. And they were absolutely lapping it up. They said sometimes she gives us stuff that would be used at students at university, don't you know? They were thrilled to bits. Now, I was in this teacher's classroom later that day, um, mixed prior attainment class, and she had the same high expectations for all the students, regardless of their starting points. But when I checked the results for geography in that school, they were the highest by a margin, similarly nationally, very high performing school. Now, that teacher didn't give those children that work in order to get great results. The great results follow from giving children material which is underpinned by high challenge. It's above their pay grade and then supporting them to get there. Um, and we're going to see an example from history in a moment. Um, so the next um, um, uh, question that we need to be asking ourselves is whether what we're offering our children is sufficiently ambitious. So um, what I'm referring to here is some work which was done by Alison Peacock and her colleague in the book Assessment for Learning Without Limits, which came out in 2015. Excellent book. And as part of um, their research, they talked to some children, um, 10 and 11 year olds. So children going from year five into year six, trying to tease out what they thought about ability tables and ability grouping. But in fact, the children's responses are about challenge and they're about provision. Um, so when they talked to the top table, they enjoyed being the bright ones and having special challenges set by the teacher. The children on the middle groups liked the sound of some of the challenges the top group had, but they knew they'd never get the chance because there, there were only six seats on the top table. Um, the children on the bottom table were affected the most. They felt dumb, useless. They thought they'd never be allowed challenges as they usually work with a teaching assistant. And this less able group liked the sound of some of the challenges the top group had, but they knew they would never get the chance. So um, what's happening in some parts of the sector, I'm not saying in your individual schools, but in too many parts of the sector, is different work being given to different groups. Um, and quite often a diminished diet for um, many of our children. Um, so it's one of the questions we are certainly asking ourselves in England, the extent to which the curriculum is ambitious for all our children, regardless of their starting points. And that, that narrative has been partly um, driven by the latest offset and framework and the quality of education judgment where we've got ambition in there for the first time. So what happens when we offer children ambitious work then um, and through demanding text. So I've got an example here from history. This is uh, Richard Kennett, who is um, a brilliant historian and a senior leader in a trust um, in Bristol. Um, and here he is, he's talking about testing out the scholarship reading homework with a year seven guinea pig class. He, every student could access it, access it, even those with a reading age below 10. Clearly we need to have higher expectations of these children. So what's happening here is they've been given serious history to read. So this is Mark Morris's uh, Norman Conquest. They've got extracts to read and to comment on. Now, interestingly, Richard says, read these two pages and answer all the questions. This is supposed to be hard. So if you can't answer all the questions, don't worry. So this high challenge, low threat, the same sort of thought processes as the geography teacher, 
pitching children above their pay grade, letting them know it's okay not to know and supporting them through talk. Then you find that they're excited to come into this. Um, so I was talking to Richard about this and I said, well, you know, have you, um, why, why have you offered them this? And he said, well, in lessons where we're learning about the Norman Conquest, we're using extracts from Simon Shamer's work. What I want children understanding is that while there might be historical events, historians disagree about the significance and impact of those. So this is normally A-level work. This is children within a few weeks of arriving in year seven. Quick example then from uh, primary. This is Ashley Booth's work. Um, both great to follow on Twitter. If you're not already, Ashley Booth, year six. Um, Richard Kennett is at Ken Radical. Um, and um, here Ashley is saying, why do I love whole class reading so much? <clears throat> because a child who would have long been considered low ability can access texts like The Caged Bird by Maya Angelou uh, with their peers and subsequently bang out that great educational term, bang out stuff like this. So um, the child has, clear, has, has clearly been supported, um, but it's their own voice coming through as they make the connection between the account of the caged bird in the, um, in the book with conditions for a, um, a large part of American, black American society in the 50s and 60s. Important, urgent work then, important and urgent as ever today, sadly. But if the child hadn't been given that text, there's no way they could have made these insights. So I'm just going to turn now quickly um, to some of the headlines of research, just to sort of back up this notion of high challenge and low threat. Um, so just very quickly, Dan Willingham's work, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, why don't students like school? Um, his work has found that human beings are curious, but thinking is hard. Also that our brains privilege story. These are incredibly helpful insights into um, putting in demanding work for our children in a way that is incredibly accessible. So I'm going to share with you now just some headlines of some research that came out of Sussex University last year, the reading aloud research, simply reading, challenging that word again, complex novels aloud and at a fast pace in each lesson, repositioned poorer readers as good readers, giving them an uninterrupted reading experience um, over a sustained period. So just a bit of detail on that. They read two novels. That's all they did for 12 weeks. They read and talked about them. Not a huge study, 365 year eights. By the end of the trial, all the students had made eight and a half months progress. What happened for the children who'd been identified as poorer readers? Almost double, almost double. So I don't think that we can afford to ignore this kind of research when we're thinking about appropriate challenge for every child. So the research paper that goes with this I can send over to Mark and Ollie, but um, two, two things uh, leap out. One is we talk to the children about why they'd done so well, the poorer readers. They said, well, we don't normally get the chance to do this more interesting work. Why? Because they're locked into uh, phonics and decoding and grammar and spelling punctuation, all of which are important. But that's not enough. These children also need this wider stipulation. They said we didn't need to understand every word because we could talk about it in class. But also because we were able to get into the story, we wanted to carry on, all right? So it's often underestimated that if children succeed very early on in something that is quite challenging, it gives them the intrinsic motivation to want to continue. And that's really important. We don't want to leave them floundering. Second interesting point was that when they talked to the teachers about their responses to these poorer readers having done so well, many of them were surprised they didn't think they'd be able to cope. So I think we've got to shift that mindset of children think, we think children can't cope, yes they can. And we've just got to take that risk, otherwise we are putting limits on children's learning. So what I'm arguing is we go to high quality resources to get that challenge in there. And I think we've got to keep an eye on the quality of um, some of the material that's coming through and whether it is sufficiently good enough for our children. Um, we cannot say we've got high challenge unless the resources we offer children um, also match those. So just a few ideas on this. Um, here we've got children learning about the interior of places of worship, uh, lower key stage two, and they are um, in this lesson, they're learning about the inside of a mosque. Um, I'm just looking at that picture. Um, colleagues, 
I don't think that is demanding enough. I think it is um, pretty third rate, actually. Then the children have got to fill in the blanks. OK, so my question there is how, how much thinking are they having to do? How challenging is it? Um, anyway, on the website, someone's written in and says, I believe there are two mistakes on the sheet. The Qibla is the direction to Mecca and the Mihrab is the place where the Imam stands to lead the prayer. The Mihrab can also indicate the direction to Mecca. Kind regards someone who knows. Now, um, to be fair, the, the, the website does change it. But my concern is before that has been um, changed, that incorrect resource will have landed in hundreds, if not thousands of different classrooms. I mean, the only saving grace is because it wasn't really challenging. They probably didn't remember. However, it's not really good enough. Um, uh, then they're going to design a mosque, which is neither art nor RE. It's just a junk activity. No challenge in there. Irrelevant. And then put ourselves out of our misery. They're going to design their own prayer mat, and they're going to include symbols to represent people or things that are important to them. So I'm a Muslim child. This lands on my desk. This is deeply offensive, very upsetting. So there's a very small tradition within Islam where it's acceptable to have images of human form. But for the most part, this is blasphemy. So we've got some real questions about materials that are just downloaded on the Internet, which are uh, simply not good enough quality and often containing um, incorrect and sometimes damaging information. So if we're on this quest for high challenge and low threat we need to make sure that we're sourcing materials properly why would i show my class this kind of work if i knew that there was a website called the museum with no frontiers which has art and artifacts um, and images from the islamic world um, my children deserve this this is challenge this is rich and it's going to the authentic sources why wouldn't they see the um an, an encounter even in in um in virtual form um, you know, tr a true mosque. Uh, examples quickly from the British Museum, all this lovely stuff. This is what children deserve, going back to the authentic places to be able to give high quality, challenging material to our children. Um, so very quickly, this teaching history with 100 objects from the British Museum. Um, these materials have been prepared with, by the academics, the experts in the field working alongside teachers. Wonderful notes, wonderful resources there. So if I'm teaching about ancient Greece, um, in either history or maybe English, if I'm teaching about uh, Greek myths, say the myth of Demeter and Persephone, why wouldn't I show my children the art and artifacts from the ancient world? This is what my children deserve in terms of challenge, in terms of authenticity, and in terms of beauty. Really substantial stuff for them to engage in rather than third-rate worksheets. So I'm making the case that we go to authentic sources. I pull together... Um, some suggestions for each of the national curriculum areas in England, um, which you might find helpful. They're on my website under resources, so marymark.com resources. You can find those there. Um, so I'm arguing that high challenge, low threat is a gift. Um, it's something to be cherished. It's something to be celebrated. And I'm going to finish now, colleagues, just by referring to the six keys to success to draw this together. Um, both from a pedagogical point of view and from a professional point of view. So this is from Rose, um, Rosabeth Moss Cantor's work. She is an, um, an, an academic at Harvard University, and she spent uh, decades of her academic career identifying the characteristics of high-performing um, organizations in the public sector and in the private sector. High-performing means doing good work in the, the fullest, um, fullest, most human sense. And she's identified six keys to success. So the first is show up. And that means not just in my physical self, am I bringing my complete self to any work that I'm doing? Or have I got half a mind on some, this is boring and doing something else. Speak up. So everyone has the right to have their voices heard. And I think we need to encourage some of our more reticent colleagues to, to speak up as well. Everyone's got good ideas. Look up. Let's remind ourselves why we do this work, why are we in the business of working with young people. And so to go back and remind ourselves of our core purpose of how we're using our professional lives, team up. And great example of that on this event today and the collaborative work that you do um, across, across, the, across your schools. Um, and I think in the last months or so, we've seen additional layers of uh, co collaboration, co cooperation as, as um, we all cope with lockdown, in and out of lockdown. Um, but I think just generally, while there's a place for doing individual research and reading, 
when we're working collectively on anything to do with school improvement, improving outcomes for young people, it's much better, much more efficient if we team up with others. Never give up. Um, Rosabeth says, um, it, success, it never feels like success when you're in the middle of doing something. So if we get weary, if there's a barrier, actually just pause, uh, regroup and continue if it's appropriate. Lift others up. So I think one of the greatest gifts we can give to another human being is to encourage them. Um, and so those are the six keys. To summarize this, let's remember colleagues that we're human beings first, we're professionals second, that the young people we're working with are human beings first and their learners second. So some quick thoughts on high challenge and low threat. I hope you found that helpful, colleagues. 